The original title of this talk given to me was Could Robots Rule the World? And I changed it, as you see, to Should Robots Rule the World? And my answer to that is no, and you'll see why in a minute. People often describe AI and robotics as game-changing technologies, but they're actually much more than that. They are totally disrupting the playing field that all of us are operating on. I decided to codify my thoughts about why robots should not rule the world into five quick principles, and then I'll give you a briefing of where we are and where we're going in AI and robotics. The first principle is that we're morally, technically, and politically obligated to manage exponential technology responsibly. And I'll tell you what I think that means. Responsible use of technology considers core human values, like respect for life and our civilization, and long-term systemic or system-wide consequences. The third point is that artificial intelligence and robotics should be used to solve grand challenge problems and improve the quality of life for all the world's citizens. The fourth point, the potential to misuse exponential technology for selfish and destructive purposes is not a reason not to pursue them. It increases the urgency to develop and use these technologies responsibly. And last, responsible use of technologies like AI and robotics requires interdisciplinary education, including ethics, and foresight in leadership and active citizenship. That's political, and it's your responsibility as well as mine. So let's talk about some recent results in artificial intelligence and robotics. We've had an amazing result recently, in the last two weeks, it was announced that Alphabet's AlphaGo AI agent beat the European Go champion. That is an amazing result. Go is a lot more complicated than chess, and this is a real achievement, and I think it will be exceeded soon by having AlphaGo beat the world champion in Go. This work was built on DeepMind's technology, and I'll show you a seminal demo that they performed in 2013. Here's Demis Hassabis from DeepMind, and you can see an AI agent playing a game of Atari Breakout. It's missing balls. It's starting from scratch. It doesn't know anything about the game. After 120 minutes of training, it's playing at a mediocre human level. You can see it's a mediocre score. But after 240 minutes of training, the system develops its own novel strategy and comes up the left-hand side of the screen, plays from the backcourt where the game has no defenses, and look at the score. That is a real breakthrough in AI, and Google bought DeepMind about a month after that seminal demo for over $500 million. Another recent result in AI, this was from September of 2015, the Allen Institute for AI and the University of Washington announced an AI system that could solve the college entrance examination SAT geometry questions as well as an average human test taker. And they used two different kinds of AIs to do this, one to read the geometric diagram and the other to do the geometric problem solving. A really outstanding result. Deep learning is the champion algorithm in machine learning. It's been used in a lot of different ways. Here's a, a great example. This is Jim Gao, who is not an AI researcher. He manages a Google data center. And he used the deep learning algorithm to optimize the efficiency of Google's data center and got a 15% improvement in power utilization efficiency. A really outstanding recent result. People often ask me for definitions of AI in the interest of time. I'm only going to focus on two. If you're talking about today's AI, it's mostly pattern recognition techniques to solve practical business and technical application problems. But if you're talking about the far future, you may be thinking of a vision of broad, deep, and subtle superhuman intelligence that hasn't happened yet. AI has even made the front cover of non-technology magazines, like the policy magazine Foreign Affairs. And why is that? 
It's because of the increasing pace of investment, acquisition, and achievement in AI. From 2011 through 2014, over $3 billion in venture capital funds were invested in artificial intelligence companies. And during the same period, over 100 AI-related companies merged or were acquired, many by large technology companies, you know the names, Google, IBM, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and others. When you go to a party, if you're in AI, and people have two responses. On the one hand, they may say, oh, that's great, you're doing AI work, now we can combine the power of IBM's Watson and Pathway Genomics and manage our own health like the CEOs of our own healthcare. Fantastic, so happy you're doing that. And then other people say, oh, I know what you're doing, you're building the Terminator. <laughs> well, not exactly. If you look at robots today, they look more like this. This is a trade-off. If anybody tells you that AI and robotics are either all good or all bad, they're cherry-picking the data. The adult conversation is that AI and robotics comes with trade-offs. Yes, faster, better, cheaper manufacturing and problem-solving, but also job disruption and human identity change and risk amplification. This is Rethink Robotics Sawyer Robot. It's dropped the cost of light assembly robots from about $200,000 to about $20,000. You don't have to program it in detail. You can position the arm, show it what you want it to do. And it even has a video camera at the end of its arm. And a friendly face for its interface. This is a DARPA-sponsored DECA robot. This man has no arm, and he has a robot uh, helping him. Uh, and what you'll see is that robot arm allows him considerable dexterity. He can move these eggs. He can move grapes into his mouth, all by manipulating his scapula. And this is the Korean team that won the DARPA robot challenge in 2015. This is sped up quite a bit. It's uh, usually much slower than this. It's a little bit like watching paint dry. But this robot drove this car in. It walks on two feet. It's bipedal. It's able to also roll on its knees. And the idea here is we want to send robots into emergency situations uh, that are radioactive, like Fukushima, instead of sending humans in where they can be subjected to considerable risk. This robot can open doors in a power plant. It can also uh, manipulate valves and cut holes in walls. It can do a really remarkable set of tasks. I had the pleasure of uh, being a passenger in the beta version of the Google robot car, the self-driving car, this was many years ago, uh, and uh, I felt completely relaxed and comfortable. This is a robot that will save millions of lives. So people worry about robots hurting us. Currently, our baseline condition is that we murder 1.2 million people a year with automobile accidents that are largely avoidable. People are drunk, or they're texting while driving, or they're distracted. These systems have a great safety record. They will literally save millions of lives. They will alter the face of transportation and public health on our highways. A big issue around AI and robotics is trust. There are a lot of people, like Elon Musk, and Stephen Hawking worried about the potential downside risk of AI and robotics. Here's Elon saying, we need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. That's a little hyperbolic. But to Elon's credit, he was with us at a conference in San Juan, Puerto Rico in January of 2015, where we had the DeepMind people there, and Nick Bostrom from Oxford, who wrote a book on some of the risks of superintelligence, and a lot of other key AI researchers. And we spent three days talking about how we can control the risk of future AIs. 
And we identified four key areas for future R&D, verification, being sure that the system meets a formal spec, validity, okay, you met the spec, but let's make sure that we have formal proofs that the spec is valid, security, making sure that the system is very hard to tamper with, super encrypted from within or without, and if all else fails, and it often does, uh, having multiple redundant ways to reestablish control. Fortune magazine had a front cover article on humans are underrated. Well, we'll see. The human brain hasn't had a major upgrade for over 50,000 years. It evolved under very different circumstances than the torrent of bits that we have today. So we are going to have to augment our intelligence. And we'll do it with a variety of different systems. We'll probably not use this method anytime soon. But uh, most of you have seen Siri, and I think Apple makes inflated claims for Siri. It says it understands what you say, it understands what you mean, but it doesn't always know what we mean. I used Siri on my way to the airport to get here. It didn't understand many of the things I was asking for. And here's Google Now that can be used in conjunction with Google Glass, also an early augmentation system. And uh, it's coming along. It's, allows you to have access to multiple services, but still very early augmentation. Here's Amazon Echo. Uh, its Alexa agent lives on my kitchen table. It can provide briefings about the news and about events in the world and allow you to buy things. Very rudimentary AI. Here's Cortana. Microsoft's early AI, they've done something very smart. They embedded this assistance system in their operating system. That's a step forward. And here's Viv. This is a company that hasn't released its product yet, but they were the architects of Siri and DARPA Kalo before that, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's pre-Siri system. The Viv team has a very bold vision. Their vision is intelligence as a utility. A utility like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or search. All of you have heard about the win of IBM's Watson over the two world champions in Jeopardy. And that was 2011. Since that time, IBM has been very bold in moving forward with Watson, including here in the UAE. IBM announced in 2013 that they were opening up their application programming interfaces to all their partners. And then in 2014, they announced that they were going to invest a billion dollars in Watson technology. And they set up a $100 million venture fund for garage-scale startups that are interested in using Watson as a platform. Let's take a brief look at what they're up to now. Technology has helped us go further, go faster, go to the moon, solve problems previous generations couldn't imagine. But can technology think? Watson can. IBM Watson is a technology unlike any that's come before. Because rather than force humans to think like a computer, Watson interacts with humans on human terms. Watson can read and understand natural language, like the tweets, texts, articles, studies, and reports that make up as much as 80% of the data in the world. A simple internet search can't do that. When asked a question, Watson generates a hypothesis and comes up with both a response and a level of confidence. And then Watson shows you the steps it took to get to that response. In a way, Watson is reasoning. You don't program Watson, you work with Watson. And through your interactions with it, it learns, just like we do. Every experience you give it makes it smarter and faster. You may have heard that Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook hired Jan LeCun, an expert in convolutional neural networks that are very good for recognizing faces, and is starting three AI labs, one in London, one in Menlo Park, and one in New York. They've announced the Deep Face 2 algorithm has a 98% recognition rate on human faces. That's about what humans can do. And application sponsors of AI have been all over the world, governments all over the world, and corporations, and for very good reason. 
I did a study of over 360 different applications of AI that were curated at the Innovative Applications of AI conference, and these are the patterns that I saw across them. And it's not just better, faster, cheaper. It's different. AI allows you to expand the range of the possible. And robotics is AI on wheels, AI with sensors and effectors. AIs and machine learning can affect every aspect of governments or corporations, from design, diagnosis, manufacturing and management, customer service, sales and configuration, and quality kind of omnidirectional impact. I'm encouraging you to create an application-oriented AI toolbox, and you can fuel your robotics with AI. Sometimes people say, don't try this at home. I'm encouraging you to try AI at home. You can download it onto your laptops with the R programming kit. It's free, and you can use R Studio to make R easier to use. And if you don't have programming skills, you can use a company like Expertify that allows you to post your problem and have curated experts bid on your problem. You can rate them as to how they did and conduct multiple cycles of posting your problems and getting curated experts, really great people, to work on your problem. And if you don't mind putting your data out in public, you can use Kaggle and that allows you to post your problem and your data and put up prize money and have hundreds of the world's best data scientists compete to solve your problem. And they've had really excellent success with that. AI is going to blow the roof off of education. Not just one laptop per child, but one tutor per child or adult learner. And AI is going to allow us to improve our decision making. I've been working at Stanford for the last seven years on building a new center for decision quality. Let's talk about futures. We eventually are going to reverse engineer the human brain, and we're going to build artificial neocortex. This is an EEG machine that allows us to measure weak electrical signals on the scalp, fMRI that puts people in a high Gauss magnetic field and we see where the blood flows when people solve different cognitive tasks. We'll synthesize all that sensor data into high resolution models of the brain. And when we develop artificial neocortex, we won't be limited by the surface area of the human skull. Our neocortex is about the size of a large dinner napkin. And without the cage of the human skull, you can imagine building artificial neocortex with the surface area of this room, or Dubai, or the UAE, or the region, or the planet. And you might think, wow, that's a little excessive. But in fact, we all have a challenge. This is the accelerating wave of human knowledge. These are science citations from the Public Library of Science. The really innovative areas of science and technology are at the intersection of these different fields. If you're particularly brilliant, you might be able to master three or five different areas of science and technology. This is an inhuman task unless we are augmented by AIs. And the partnership of humans plus AIs is an effective partnership to address this problem. If you're worried about AIs getting out of control or being con all the benefits being concentrated uh, in Facebook or Google or Apple or other companies, uh, you'll be glad to know that Elon Musk and Y Combinator have created a new entity, OpenAI, with a billion dollars plus in funding to provide beneficial AI that will be open source to everyone. You may recognize this as the garage that was the birthplace of Hewlett-Packard, I would say that assuming zero new technology breakthroughs, professional white-collar work is ripe for disruption. White-collar workers have no problem automating blue-collar jobs, but when it comes to their jobs, they often think all jobs can be automated except ours, of course. There was a study done by the Oxford Martin School in 2013 on the susceptibility of U.S. jobs to computerization over the next 10 to 20 years. This is not immediately. And they concluded that 47% of the US white collar jobs, 
routine jobs primarily, would be vulnerable to automation. And since then, just in the last few weeks, they've updated that study with a new study called Technology at Work, The Future Isn't What It Used to Be. And they've concluded that, in fact, the rate of susceptibility to automation depends on what country you're in and your mix of skills, your mix of jobs. If you have a lot of routine jobs, more susceptibility to automation. If you have jobs that require creativity and high skill levels, then it's less susceptible to automation. It's worth paying attention to this study. The key, however, in managing the benefits and risks of AI and robotics is human plus AI and robotics plus good business processes, including the kind of principles that I outlined at the beginning of this talk. AIs are going to change the balance of power between small companies and big companies, between small countries and big countries. So what if we succeed in creating superhuman intelligence? Well, we'll solve some very hard problems in climate change and energy and aging, but we could suffer some unintended consequences or even malicious consequences. My stance about this is that we are morally responsible for our inventions, and we're going to need advanced R&D in specification, validity, security, and control. I also think that we should be proactive about providing free, high-quality education and a basic income for those people that need it. People often ask me how to think outside the box. My answer, there is no box. All of us live in mental prisons, and you can choose the color or the geometry that you like the best. It's still a mental prison. And I think that our task, all of us, is to help each other break out of our mental prisons. I believe that sustainable intelligence requires mathematical, ecological, and ethical literacy. It's important to have some perspective about this. This is a shot of the Earth inside the yellow ring, that little blue dot, what Carl Sagan called the pale blue dot of Earth. When you take a look at that, that is the place where everyone you have ever loved lives, where everyone you've ever read about in history lived. It's where all of us have our future. We are all on this planet together, and we better act like it. Thank you very much.